hope the sound is okay. Um, thanks again for having me here. And um, I believe this is fifth or sixth time that I'm giving this lecture, different variations of it. But very first time that it's completely web-based uh, with no audience. So I believe we are all getting used to a new norm. Um, hope everybody has been well. And um, thank you again for participating in this. So uh, varicose veins is a very common uh, process and entity that exists and involves multiple people, male, female, different ethnicity throughout the community. And these are just some pictures of our local patients that I've collected over the years. And as you can see, they come in all sizes and shapes, all different locations, and uh, affect people clinically, as you will learn, in many different ways. So some people will consider the third picture as ropes, um, trail maps, um, train rails. Uh, grandchildren will you know, run their race cars on grandma's legs. I've heard all kinds of stories, and uh, once we remove them, uh, grandma comes back and says, my granddaughter is complaining she doesn't have a train track anymore. Now, the, above, the previously seen pictures were varicose veins. That's the definition of varicose veins, is if you see the thumb size ropey veins. But what about telangiectasias? I'm sure you guys have probably heard of that name as well. And telangiectasias is the next step down from ropey varicose veins. It is a cluster of these dark veins, again, seen anywhere in the legs, usually in the legs. Uh, we do see them sometimes in other parts of the body, but I am most commonly involved with patients who have these entities in the lower extremities. These are usually raised. You can feel a lump or a bump on the skin when you run your hands through uh, the area. And with ultrasound, which is, again, the very first thing we're going to do to evaluate where these things come from, you often will identify a small one to two millimeter vein underneath that cluster that can be treated and should be treated in addition to surface treatments. Here are some other examples of telangiectasias. And of course, there are spider veins. I think just about 99.5 of the population, percent of the population has spider veins to some extent. And spider veins is yet another step down from telangiectasias. They are smaller, they are not as raised, not as blue or purple, and oftentimes just faintly pink and creeping just right onto the skin. For the purpose of this talk, I've actually included larger scale of spider veins just so that they're visible for everyone in the video. But everyone who has this degree of veins, if you look closely on their lower extremities, they will have the little pink guys that are much more prevalent than the blue, more prominent veins that you're seeing here. Okay, so forms of spider veins, or I'm sorry, varicose veins that we just touched upon. The strict definition of varicosities, which are ropey, bulging veins. The next level is telangiectasias, raised cluster of purple-blue veins, sometimes and oftentimes associated with a larger vessel underneath. And then spider veins that are pink, purple, to slightly blue, usually not raised and can't be felt when you run your finger across the skin, and usually not associated with a larger vessel underneath if you were to do an ultrasound. There are patients who present with basically next to no visible, externally visible veins, but they have all kinds of symptoms. And I don't judge just by looking at a patient. We do an ultrasound. And oftentimes, I am surprised what I find on the ultrasound, which are abnormal valvular incompetence that are causing symptoms 
but really no externally visible varicosities. So this is where a physician really should just listen to the patient. Just a few information on demographics of um, varicose veins. Affects lots of population, as you can see, and it increases with age and weight. Why is that? Well, with age, our collagen level, our elasticity decreases with age. And so the vessels aren't as strong. The muscles aren't as strong, and the vessels become leaky. In addition, the valves have sustained lifelong years and years worth of gravitational pull, and that wears and tears. Um, obesity and weight or increased weight adds to that gravitational pull and causes all kinds of havoc on our bodies, including the valves of the veins. And every vein in our body, big or small, deep or superficial, have valves. Um, there are combined congenital and environmental causes. Congenital would be my grandma had them. Uh, my mom has big varicose veins. My sister has big varicose veins. And so I think I have them too. Um, and yes, it does run uh, congenitally. There is not a test or a genetic anything that you can do to identify whether you're at risk, but we certainly have heard of all those statements. Environmental, what about someone who, what about a teacher who's on her feet all day? Uh, what about someone who um, has a hobby of fencing who is on their feet all day? So environmental definitely contributes as well, and if you have a combination of the two, then that is when you present earlier in life with ropey varicose veins and symptoms. There's a myth out there that many, unfortunately, physicians included um, are saying to the public, they are just cosmetic. And you will see in this talk how varicosities and valvular incompetence can oftentimes not just be cosmetic. So what are some of the symptoms that can be caused by varicosities? Very commonly heard or experienced are heaviness, uh, overall general achiness of the legs. Um, my legs just feel really heavy at the end of the day. They swell, my ankles are double the size. I have elephantitis of my ankles and my calves. They throb, um, I have to sit down or hang myself upside down for half an hour in order for my legs to feel better. Um, I wake up multiple times a night from crampiness, from restlessness. I can't seem to get comfortable. While many other causes, uh, mineral deficiencies, vitamin deficiencies, etc., can also contribute to some of these symptoms, if they are combined with obviously externally visible varicose veins, you can um, assume or at least to some degree associate these symptoms with varicosities. Then there is the worst case scenario that can develop from varicosities, which no longer becomes cosmetic for sure, would be um, cellulitis, which is infection of the skin because of lack of healing of little nicks and scrapes that we make on our legs all the time. That evolve into long-term dermatitis, skin thickening, skin hardening, hyperpigmentation, which means your skin, instead of that pink, nice, natural look, becomes pigmented. It becomes red, then brown, red or purple, then brown, sometimes deep brown, and when you feel it, it is rock hard. It is not soft, silky skin. Eventually develop, developing into lipodermatosclerosis, which is basically just a complicated term for long-term hardening and dermatitis of the skin. Um, it is in this case caused by valvular incompetence and chronic pooling of blood in the legs that causes poor healing and chronic swelling. Ulceration is when the skin actually breaks and becomes a crater. So it's no longer just discoloration, it's no longer intact. And when that happens, a tiny 
little needle stick can evolve into a deep crater that in some patients go all the way down to the bone. They are very painful. Um, they, as you can imagine, um, are full of medical complexities, uh, difficult to treat, take a long time to heal, and it takes multiple different subspecialties such as wound care, um, surgery, and vein treatments when appropriate, combined with therapy, wrapping, et cetera, to get these people to heal. And um, from a healthcare dollar standpoint, this creates millions and millions worth of expenditure from an insurance standpoint every year. So anything that we can do to prevent patients' venous stasis from developing to this stage is good for the patient and good for all of us. Um, most of the not so ulcerating or dermatic um, conditions, such as the heaviness, achiness, usually are described as worse at the end of the day or with prolonged standing. Those are some other things that you can look for for yourself that might give you an indication that, hmm, maybe I have valvular incompetence. Uh, maybe I have uh, varicose veins, even if I didn't see much. So I just wanted to throw some pictures out there for patients with dermatitis and ulceration. And they're not pretty, and in this gentleman, as you can see, there are ropey varicose veins that are traveling down the thigh, the inner thigh of this gentleman that eventually was the cause of his ulceration. And the pink and brown and purple skin underneath are what, was, what we described as uh, dermatitis. Here is another patient. The ulcer is at the front of the shin, and it is a fairly large crater. It is fairly deep, and it is packed with wound care dressing. Here is another one where the pack is taken off. It is not very deep, and it is showing signs of healing. But again, you can imagine how painful these lesions can be. And finally, it sometimes affects both lower extremities. Um, and as you can see, it doesn't have to be associated with significant swelling. Oftentimes it is, but it doesn't have to be. There are many, um, uh, there, patients are affected differently by valvular incompetence. Okay. So we've talked enough about valvular incompetence. Well, what exactly is valvular incompetence? Um, in our legs, there are two major types of veins. There are the deep system, which in these pictures are colored by the deep blue, and there are the superficial systems, which are the lighter blue. And it is specifically the superficial system that we are talking about when it comes to causes of varicosities that can be treated. There is for sure deep system valvular incompetence that cause problems as well, and also cause problems a lot sooner and a lot more severe. But to this day, there is no permanent uh, proven, long-term proven surgery that can fix those deep system valves. So we are mainly talking about fixing the superficial system. When the valves are broken, blood pools, and it has to go somewhere. And there are million and one other little vessels that communicate with the gray saphenous system and the lesser saphenous system, or otherwise called small saphenous vein, that then subsequently get the brunt of these pooling. And when these little vessels pool, that's when they become the large ropey varicose veins that you see externally. I th this is a diagram or schematic diagram that um, explains, I think, to some extent, uh, valvular incompetence. So on the left-hand side are normal valves. They are tented in normal uh, anatomy or shape. So when you walk and when you squeeze your calf, you squeeze blood going upwards. And then the valves or the leaflets of that tent closes up and therefore preventing gravity from pulling that blood going back down. But when you have valvular incompetence, the tent is reversed. 
And so it no longer stops gravity from pulling down on the blood, and therefore the veins pull blood. They become stretchy. The blood goes out into the little external venules and become varicosities. And that pooling subsequently leads to the slew of symptoms that we have earlier discussed. So I am going to show you a video that I think live uh, shows or explains better um, how this works. This animation shows how varicose veins form. Varicose veins are swollen veins that are a blue or purple color. They show through the skin, usually on the legs and feet. Click the navigation arrows below the animation screen to play, pause, rewind, or fast forward the animation. The superficial veins lie below the surface of the skin. The deep veins pass through the deep tissues of the legs. They transport blood from the legs and feet back up towards the heart. The superficial and deep veins are connected by perforator veins. Here we show the position of the deep veins, superficial veins and perforator veins in the leg. The deep veins run between the muscles of the legs. Contractions of these muscles, when you move your legs and ankles, help to squeeze the blood back up towards your heart. Veins also have valves that prevent the blood from flowing back towards your feet. Here we show a valve and the muscles around the vein. Varicose veins are thought to develop when the valves don't close properly. Here we show a valve in a superficial leg vein. If the valves don't work properly, the blood is able to flow backwards. Blood pools in the vein, causing the vein to stretch. This is called a varicose vein. Here we show a vein that has become varicose. Here we show a varicose vein in the lower leg. Varicose veins may cause symptoms such as aching, itchiness, or swelling of the ankles. However, often they don't cause any symptoms. The main problem is usually their appearance. Okay. Um, to start the slideshow, That must not be it. Okay. Is it changing? There. Okay. So I hope that was um, a good explanation and a schematic diagram in a video to explain um, what, that, what we mean by incompetent valves. So how many of you have heard um, all of these statements? Um, if you actually have symptoms um, and you have ropey externally visible varicose veins, your friends, your family, your grandma, your doctors tell you to just live with it. Why? Because they believe it is um, cosmetic and not uh, medically necessary to get treated. Insurance companies actually at one point also thought the same until they realize how much money they're spending per year on dermatitis and ulceration. So they actually have specific criteria these days, and every insurance company is different, Medicare included, um, that will tell you whether or not you are medically thought to be necessary to be treated. And if so, they will cover treatment. And no, uh, it's not that nothing can be done, there's actually quite a bit that can be done these days, and minimally invasively. What are some of the self-care measures that you can do to help if you have symptoms, but you don't want to come in the hospital because it's COVID. Um, they're not bad enough, and they're really not interfering with your daily life, and you just want to see what happens in the long run. 
These are all reasonable. Um, so exercise, we've heard multiple times how healthy and beneficial exercise can be for us in multiple different ways. When we exercise, we are using our calf muscles. So that means we're squeezing those veins and we are helping those veins to empty the, bl the blood if the valves are broken um, to go back towards the heart. So we're helping our circulation. We are increasing our circulation by increasing our heart rate. We are conditioning our muscles. So exercise in general is great. But what if you have bad valves or valves that are bad enough that you know, after prolonged skiing, bike riding, um, running, walking, hiking, whatever it is, these veins become huge. Um, they are very painful. They are very uncomfortable. Yes, and that can happen. That is when there's a balance between there's exercise that's going to help you and be preventative, but if it's already broken, the exercise and the prolonged standing on your feet are going to worsen your symptoms. Um, we talked about earlier how adding extra weight to ourselves will just help gravity to create more problems. So maintaining a healthy weight is beneficial as well. Um, elevation, when you are sitting, instead of sitting cross-legged like we all want to do, and it's very brainless and uh, you know mindless, I do it all the time, but when you're crossing your legs, uh, especially if you cross a double cross, um, you are pinching on your deep system in some shape or form. You might not be completely obstructing your flow, but that pinch added to, if there is underlying valvular incompetence, can add to your symptoms. So avoid crossing legs would be great. Uh, when you are sitting, um, get up every once in a while and walk around, squeeze your calf a little bit. Same, so if you have a sitting job, um, same thing with long flights, long car rides. It's really important that you get up and walk around a little bit and go for a, a stop or a sightseeing somewhere. And in the airplane, go walk up and down the, the, the hall a little bit or the um, pathway a little bit in the middle. And the uh, best thing that we can all do for ourselves, regardless of whether or not you have varicosities, is application of compression stocking. And by compression, it can, go be, it can be anything from 15 millimeters mercury, which would be the lowest that I would recommend in degree, to 30 to 40. And that usually are um, patients who need treatment. Those ulcer patients, they are often getting custom fitted for 60 millimeter mercury, 100 millimeter mercury tight compression wraps and compression uh, stockings. Compression, as you can imagine, externally add to the pressure and support for your veins. So therefore, they help fight against gravity. And as a result, they decrease the swelling. And by decreasing swelling, it makes your circulation healthier, makes your skin healthier, and you can heal better, and therefore have less discomfort, less heaviness, less achiness. There are many, many times that um, just with age, we have no valvular incompetence. We have no varicose veins, but we feel that heaviness and we feel that ache at our lower extremities, especially at the end of the day. Try a pair of well-fitted compression stocking, and I guarantee you it'll give you energy. It'll, it'll make your day every day. They can be hot, and if ill-fitted, they can cause pain. So it is important that you get your compression stocking measured and fitted adequately and professionally oftentimes. Um, and it is a myth that compression stocking pinch on my knee or behind my knee and therefore cut off my circulation. Um, it can happen if the stocking is very ill-fitted and it's too tight for you. Um, and it is possible that a lot of people can't tolerate compression around their toes. So it's painful around their toes, but there are toeless compressions. And there are also just calf sleeves that runners uh, stores have that are medical grade compressions that you just wear your own socks over that can help as well. 
So there are many, many other solutions out there. Um, if you're going to get compression for the purpose of treatment, meaning you've done a varicose vein treatment, um, or you've got ropey varicose veins externally visible and you want to try compression before treatment to see if it makes a difference, I often recommend 20 to 30, which is the moderate grade compression. You can buy them online, uh, you can buy them at medical stores, and um, I think there's a, actually quite a bit of uh, sports stores around that will sell you up to 20 millimeter mercury uh, grade. You just have to read the label, but every box come with a sizing chart. So take a little ruler with you, uh, a little measuring tape with you, and go with the sizing chart and measure your calf and your ankle correctly so that you are correctly fitted. Um, there are, um, I just wanna say really quickly, there are a few companies that actually take into consideration the length, because we are all different height, and that actually becomes one of the best fitting compressions that you can get. So very few companies actually do that. Um, other self-care measures, um, there are homeopathic pathways. Horse chestnut is a herb that is most commonly heard about improvement in circulation. Butcher's broom is another one. Um, and there are essential oils. Uh, there are, so witch hazel, apple cider vinegar are astringents. So they vasoconstrict. Um, you can often see these in cosmetic lines to help with redness of the skin. Um, so some people say, hey, you know, they could help with varicosities. I will say that None of them in a single agent form has ever been proven to work for, you know, a large majority of the population. So just like any other herbs out there, it works for some people, it doesn't work for others. Okay, um, what are some of the treatments that we have heard about uh, varicose vein treatments? Traditionally, surgeons do vein stripping or ligation. And I'm sure you've all probably had a relative or a friend uh, who might have even had uh, these procedures. Uh, stripping is where they actually make a skin incision and they literally remove the entire or as much of the gray saphenous vein along the inner thigh as possible. They invert the vein and take the whole thing out. Um, it is, you're black and blue afterwards and there's quite a bit of healing. Uh, ligation is where they cut into the vein at different segments of the leg. So you'll see patients who have cuts, they're about half an inch long or so all along the leg where they go in, find the vein, and they cut these veins off. Um, the stripping historically has worked better than ligation. If you have any of a segment of varicose vein remaining that's not removed, we have connection channels all over our legs that will feed back into those segments. And then those segments become varicose again. And guess what? If you've ligated, you just burned your bridge for somebody getting in there and uh, treating that segment that's now, again, bad. So what we do these days are laser. And these are some of the terms you might have heard about um, the closure fast procedure, which is um, a form of heat ablation. EVLT is laser ablation. VNUS is um, another form of heat ablation and radiofrequency ablation. These are all terms that you might have heard uh, with what we do with ablation today. Um, microfoam sclerotherapy is used when there are little channels around, and everybody has those, that are not amenable to laser ablation. So you can only laser a straight segment. And oftentimes, we're lasering the gray saphenous system or the lesser saphenous system. But all the little channels on the sides, the tributaries, the perforators, as the video had talked about, the bridging veins between the deep and the superficial, those are often treated with sclerotherapy. But if you have veins the size of a thumb and sclerosins are mixed with blood, therefore dilute by blood, the bigger the vein, the more blood. The more blood, the more dilute the sclerosin. 
therefore the less effective the sclerosin. So if you have a thumb sized vein, you might have to do sclerotherapy four or five times to even just shrink the size of that vein down and even then might not completely go away. So what do you do? Well, I would offer a microflubectomy. And that is actually a miniature version of stripping. It's not really stripping, it's where you make a tiny little nick right on top of that rope and you numb the skin up, everything's sterile, everything is in the uh, operating room environment and you actually hook the vein and remove that bulging segment. It is more invasive, it does require sedation, whereas every other treatment does not, but it takes care of it once and for all. And these are various different forms of treatments that we offer today, and everybody gets a different combination. It depends on the size of your vein, depends on your symptoms, do you have ulcer, etc. So we take a lot of information into consideration and decide what treatment combination is best for you. The first step, though, is to figure out where do these veins come from. And that means getting an ultrasound. Um, at BCH, you, if you call to make an, a, a, a varicose vein appointment, it is a special office that makes these appointments, and it comes with a consultation with me. The sonographer will um, come in, do the preliminary measurements that I have set for them. Then I come in, and I do the rest of the study. To me, it is very important that I lay an eye on your legs and your ultrasound because a picture is worth a thousand words. The sonographer, who are very experienced at Boulder Community, will tell you that vein anatomy is some of the most complicated and confusing pictures that they see with their daily work. And they're not gonna be able to tell me, okay, you've got to burn this one, Dr. Mao, you've got to laser that one, Dr. Mao. I have to get a mental picture of myself. So I see you, I look at your legs, we talk about your symptoms, I then evaluate your valvular incompetence and I map out my own graph for your legs so that later when you come back, and then I put that in the report, later when you come back for the procedure, and it could be 50 patients later, I'm not gonna confuse your legs with someone else's because my report is very clear on what you need done. And we outline it right there. And then insurance authorization and scheduling, et cetera. Um, let me show you a second video and last one of this talk on what valvular incompetence actually looks like in ultrasound, and this is what we look for in ultrasound. Okay, so I muted this ultrasound because I want to talk about the flow. When you see different colors on an ultrasound, which is also what we look for, orange, in this instance, is correct direction. So when somebody is down below and you're upright and we're squeezing your calf, we're gonna see blood flow going towards the head because I'm squeezing your calf. That's the orange. But then when I let up, you're standing up and gravity is gonna pull your blood down and that's the blue, if you have any. And then we time, I don't know if I can show that again, we time the amount of reflux by how many seconds are you showing in blue. And you can see in the middle of the screen is a little leaflet looking thing in the color that actually is the valve. And in this case, this, this is a valve that the leaflets do not close and they're just flopping reverse. It should be going this direction, but the leaflets are actually flopping backwards in that direction. So it is um, incompetent. So the timing of that reflux is critical for insurance authorization, number one. And again, it has to meet certain criteria. And number two, to tell me the degree of severity of your incompetence, and that also um, guides on what are, do you need treatment at all? What are some of the treatments available for you? Okay, 
So we just talked about all that, and all of this is performed, um, the procedure uh, themselves are performed in the interventional radiology suite. It's, uh, it's an operating room condition. Um, you are going to be prepped and draped uh, just like a surgery patient. You're gonna be in blue. We're all gonna be in blue, hat and mask and gowned. And there's me with one of my um, um, staff, one of my technologists, and uh, we do the procedure together. And if you're gonna get microphlebectomy, as we mentioned earlier, you're gonna get conscious sedation, which is fentanyl and Versed, which means uh, MPO after midnight, you need a ride. But if it's just laser and sclerotherapy, there are, it's local anesthetics and no sedation needed for most time, most of the cases. Um, we're gonna identify by ultrasound where we need to treat. Once that is mapped out and identified, the laser catheter is inserted to that vein. As if you can see here, the laser catheter is inserted into that vein. Then we numb up the entirety of the segment that need to be lasered. Let's go back. And then we laser that segment after numbing medicine. Okay. And what about those ropes that we talked about earlier? That scler sclerotherapy might not completely uh, make go away. So that's where microflebectomy comes in. So you're gonna come in, and let's just say you have these size of varicose veins, and we talk and we deem that you want to go through with the one-step microflebectomy. On the day that you come, we're gonna map your veins out when you're in the, um, the uh, pre-surgical area. You're gonna be standing and I'm gonna map your veins out. And then you're gonna go on the table. Different, these are different patients, obviously. And your leg is gonna be prepped and draped in a very sterile fashion. And we're gonna remove uh, those veins. First numbing up along the mapped out blue lines, then tiny little nicks, and we're gonna physically remove them. How many nicks are needed depending, depends on how extensive the varicose veins are, how big they are, how many you have. Okay, so outcomes. Let's see some pictures. These are pre and post pictures of the patients that you have seen all along the talk. Usually these are two months after. Two weeks after, however, you're gonna see me, we're gonna check and make sure that the veins that we closed are indeed closed. Do you need additional sclerotherapy if you didn't need microflobectomy? The insurances usually approve, or at least we approve up to three times in a row for sclerotherapy. And do we need to proceed with microflobectomy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then two months later, after every treatment and healing and bruising is gone, and we come back for a final visit. Again, these are some of the pre and post pictures for patients usually at about the, the two month time. So this is the front of that one patient and this is the back of this patient that before the procedure had these row P veins. And these veins all come from different sources that ultrasound will tell us what else to do. Okay. Uh, this patient on the table, there's some bruising remaining, but the ropey varicose veins are gone, and the bruising will go away. Again, large ropey varicose veins, a little bit of bruising left, but the ropes are mostly gone. For most of my patients, they are doing this for the medical reasons, not the cosmetic. So we can continue to get better from this look, but I will be honest with you, most of my patients they're perfectly happy even if they just had that left. And ulceration, this is that patient that had this ulcer and after varicose vein treatment, it healed. The discoloration is much better. The skin looks much healthier. And you see this grid line? It's that stocking. That's a 60 millimeter mercury compression stocking that he just pulled down to show me his ulcer just so I can take a picture. And it is super tight, but he wears it all the time. Okay, this patient is amazing. He had, this is I think um, 20 years. 
Um, at age 17 or, or 15, I can't remember, someone uh, stripped his uh, gray saphenous system and uh, was, must have been determined uh, incompetent at the time. And he does have a uh, port wine stain uh, to his skin, so that's the birthmark. But what's not normal is this ulceration and skin breakdown. Well, subsequently he developed, after the stripping, multiple other sources of valvular incompetence. And eventually, and he lived with this for 20 plus years, eventually somebody said, oh, you ought to go get an ultrasound and go get it checked out. So he came and saw me, and uh, I found the, the incompetent veins, treated his incompetent veins. He was hospitalized because there were so many bacteria in this skin from 20 years worth of open source. He got septic just from a needle stick. So he got treated with antibiotics, and literally one month in the hospital, but his leg was closing in front of your eyes, literally on a daily basis. It was, it was amazing. And this is about a month after the treatment. The port wine stain, that's his birthmark, is still there, but the ulcers have healed. And these are the kind of stuff that makes me very, feel very rewarded in doing this line of work. And as you can see, it definitively is not just cosmetic. So we don't want to wait till it gets to this point to get treatment. On a lesser scale, what about some of the telangiectasias? What we do these days, oh, I guess there's a third video. What we do these days is a sclerotherapy injection to these telangiectasias that um, are not ultrasound guided. I just use magnifying glasses, tiny, tiny little needle, and a different kind of sclerosant, and I go straight into these blue veins, and we make them blanch out. They will be red and purple and kind of inflamed for a little bit, and then when that dies down and quiets down, the veins get better. It definitely, when you have this many spider and telangiectasias, requires multiple episodes of treatment. There's, there's only a, a set amount or volume of the sclerosin that I can do that's safe, and it's not gonna treat it all at once. So that's the cosmetic side of, of this um, line of treatment that we can offer as well, oftentimes done in conjunction with the rest of it. And I don't know if we have time to show the third video. I don't, if, I don't know if it's um, loaded, but we don't have to actually show it today. Are we okay on time? Okay, so I'm just going to finish up then. Um, there are many, many causes of varicose veins. What we touched on today is just the peak of the iceberg. It is um, what, we, what I do on a daily basis. And there are other things that I'm going to find in the middle of your ultrasound that is going to lead to other studies. And if you're that person or that patient, you're gonna hear me suggest a pelvic ultrasound a CT scan of your belly, where all, it's, it's, the purpose of it is to fully understand the process, identify the source, and treat it all, otherwise they're all just gonna come back. So I hope that this has been very informative for you, um, and uh, happy legs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mao. Um, I do have a few questions here. For the past f year or so, I have had weird feelings in my calves, like numb numbness or tingling like ants. Could this be varicose? Well, they do, yes. Numbness and tingling um, are often described. But so, so it depends on where the numbness and tingling. Um, is it feet? Is it calves? Is it thigh? The higher up the leg you go, the less likely that it's valvular incompetence. If it's feet, do you have diabetic neuropathy? Are you a diabetic? Um, do you have nerve impingement that could be causing numbness and tingling? Is it associated with back pain? These are all the things we're gonna address at the time of ultrasound. Would a total knee replacement affect how varicose veins can be treated? No. Um, 
If you have ropey varicose veins, it depends on where they are. So knee replacement cuts in front of the knee and under the uh, patella. If you have bad leg swelling, so say for example, venous stasis edema in your ankles, that tells me there is going to be slow healing because again, edema and pooling means relatively slower and poor healing of your tissue in general. Oftentimes, orthopedic surgery will ask us to treat varicose veins in that degree prior to their knee replacement just to facilitate their surgery healing. They want you to heal better and heal fast. Um, the other problem is with um, knee surgery or any kind of orthopedic surgery, a hip replacement, for example, um, or a broken bone, you're gonna be potentially bed rested or in crutches or in, ca in a, a cast. And guess what those ropey varicose veins do? They pull blood, which means stagnation of blood, which means increased possibility of clotting to begin with. What if you add bed rest and immobility to that? Much higher chance of clotting and getting what's called superficial thrombophlebitis. So the orthopedic surgeons have become very aware of that. Um, so they oftentimes do ask for varicose vein treatments, it, you know, depending on how bad the veins are um, prior to any orthopedic surgery, any extensive orthopedic surgery. When a varicose vein is removed, how does the blood flow? Right, so I get, I get asked this all the time. Um, the, you have a million and one veins in your legs, and the deep system is where we want to drive all of your return of blood as much as possible. So if you have an incompetent superficial system, it's doing nothing but pulling blood down. If it's big in size, they can't use it for other surgeries, and it's doing nothing, it's like an appendix. You have it, when it's normal, you keep it. When it's abnormal, do you keep it? So if you remove it, then that actually improves your circulation because it forces the blood that otherwise was going to pool in the veins back into the healthier system and back to your heart. So in essence, again, depending on the degree of reflux and incompetence, we want to treat so to improve your circulation, not make it worse. How will I know when to seek medical care for my spider veins? I have pain after, after standing, walking for a long time. And there are no externally visible veins. I'm assuming there are spider veins only, but not externally visible varicose veins, but there are symptoms with heaviness and pain with prolonged standing. Um, well, spider veins are not medically necessary to treat. They are cosmetic only. So the answer, the strict answer to that question, if we're talking strictly definition of spider veins, um, is you never need them treated unless you want your legs to look better. So you would not be treating them for, for medical reasons. But the pain and the achiness, that's not caused by spider veins. It I doesn't matter how many spider veins we have, that's not caused by spider veins. That would, if it is vein related, it, would, it tells me that there's something deeper going on that just hasn't manifested. Like we talked about earlier, many patients with symptoms who don't have externally visible varicose veins. And again, that would be an ultrasound to figure out, is that, is that there? I have major varicose veins in my right leg and nothing at all on my left. That's how, pr pretty common. How come only one leg is affected? So um, it's, very, it's pretty common to have one or the other uh, being worse. Uh, I would say a good 30% of the patients are in that population. Um, a good 30 more percent of the uh, populations um, have it on both sides, but definitely worse on one than the other. And then the rest of the patients are fairly symmetric. Um, left side oftentimes is worse than the right. Um, if you're gonna make a generic 
you know, statement which one if you're going to bank on to be worse. Left side usually is worse because of the anatomy of the deeper system, um, but it does not mean it is. So I don't have an explanation as to why. Do we stand on our feet and jump on one leg for a prolonged time? I'm just joking, but I don't have an explanation why. Apart from ulcers and dermatitis, what are the health dangers of varicose veins? Apart from? Uh, uh, ulcers and dermatitis. Uh, uh, derma dermatitis, yeah. mm-hmm. What are the? the uh, what are the health dangers of okay. varicose veins? Okay, so um, on the lighter, on the less severe side, if you have heaviness, achiness, cramping, restlessness, and you can't sleep at night, that translates to um, you know, sleep deprivation, say for example, discomfort on a daily basis. Um, you don't want to stay on your feet all day and you don't want to go for that hike because you know your legs are going to ache at the end of that hike. So could that in essence indirectly lead to a relative less um, active state that you otherwise would have had? So that's on the milder side, how different people feel differently about their legs, right? The, are my symptoms bothering me enough? And prohibiting quality of life for me enough to warrant seeking help or evaluation or treatment. And then on the more severe side, intermediate side, would be, again, the stagnation of blood. If you have very incompetent valves and very big veins underneath, not, may or may not even be associated with big veins on the outside. If ultrasound shows 10 plus seconds of reflux, your chances of making a blood clot in that vein is much higher than somebody who has no reflux or even one or two seconds worth of reflux. And that clot in the superficial system directly is communicating with your deep system, which means it can fly off and go into the deep system and go into lungs, cause pulmonary embolism, et cetera. So those are some other medical risks other than ulcers and dermatitis. I have visible varicose veins and have suffered from cramps in my calves and shins at night morning. Could these cramps be symptoms? Yeah. Yep. I, I, those, are, those will be good enough for me to get an ultrasound and see. I've been wearing c compression stockings and they are very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions on where to get a correct fit? Fitted? Well, I don't have, her inf I don't have her information with me today, but when you come for an ultrasound, um, I, there's a sheet that I have that have um, three locations. Um, there's a physical therapist in Boulder who personally fits and or measures and fits. Um, there is a store in Louisville that um, is a, like a hole in the wall, but it's a really great place. Um, they also measure and fit. There's a store, medical supply store in Longmont, uh, because there's a lot of patients that I have from Longmont. Um, so, there are different places you definitely can go to get fitted. Um, at minimum, though, start by yourself, you know, take a flexible tape and measure yourself. Once you have spider veins, is there any chance they will clear up or will they be present visible forever? Or Once you have spider veins? Once you have spider veins. I don't think they go away on their own. Um, there are different creams out there that people are going to sell you that say, rub this on and see what happens. I have not heard rave reviews of them. Um, you're going to need some sort of treatment, whether it's an injection or a lasering, and, and that depends on different esthetician's office or dermatology office that might or might not do the lasering, depending on the size of them. I don't think they just go away on their own. Does a balanced vegan plant-based diet affect the formation of varicose veins? No, it's just good to have in general, but it doesn't affect um, competency of valves. Okay. How soon after you have finished blood thinners can you proceed with invasive procedures? In general? How soon after blood th uh, finished blood thinners? Depends on the blood thinner. Um, you know, if it's Coumadin, your INR usually runs at 3.5, you'd have to stop for a good five days. If it's Eloquiz or some of the other drugs, it's Zeralto, you know, 24 to 48 hours. So it depends on the med. 
And it, to be honest, depends on the surgery. And I think this will be our last question. I've had varicose vein stripping in my left leg some, some years ago. After, oh, some years after a misguided exploratory lap, laparotomy where they packed, my, they packed my guts back in leaving a lopsided excess and bulged on, and bulge on my lower left abdomen, abdomen. A few years later, the left leg varicose veins returned and now I wear compression hose to prevent worsening. Do you see an alternative? So there was surgery and varicose veins returned sometime after surgery and there has been a previous stripping, it sounds like. Um, alternative to, con to constantly wearing compression, um, you know, it's hard for me to say without knowing what the cause of the varicose veins are and what the source of the varicose veins are. Um, if ultrasound identifies a new source that can be ablated or treated with sclerotherapy, that's, that would be the alternative. If ultrasound shows no other source, um, it, again, it just really depends on what the source of the varicose veins are. We've come to the end of our time. A recording of tonight's lecture will be available at bch.org slash livestream in a couple of days. You will receive a post-lecture survey by email tomorrow. Please take a minute to fill this out. And thank you for joining us and have a great night. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Mao. Thank you.